co-founder of this company called Expec Labs. We are a San Francisco technology company, uh, and we are one of the early pioneers of this discipline called anticipatory computing. Uh, and I'm here today to tell you all about how, within the next few years, you're going to come to rely on these intelligent voice interfaces every single day. In fact, these, uh, these interfaces are going to become so pervasive and widespread that you're going to expect that you'll be able to walk up to any computing device and have the option to speak to it, kind of like in this video that you might have seen. Volume? Computer? Computer? Ah. Hello, computer. Just use the keyboard. So that's, uh, so I know what you're probably saying. You've uh, heard people talk about uh, speech recognition before, and scientists have been working on this technology for decades. Uh, and there's been many times where people have said this technology is right around the corner, but for some reason, it always seems to fall short of our expectations. Uh, this is exactly how I feel about it, um, or how I did feel about it. Um, and uh, in the late 90s, when I was finishing my PhD at the AI lab at MIT, this was absolutely the case. We used to give tours to uh, visitors to the lab, show them all the new technology and, uh, that we were developing there, and made a specific point to avoid the speech recognition lab because the demos were notoriously fail. Uh, in fact, I bet if I asked most of you in the room what your recent experience was with speech recognition, it would probably be something like what's going on in this video here. <laughs> Press the buttons. Oh no, they installed voice recognition technology in this lift ahead of us. Voice recognition technology in a lift in Scotland. You ever tried voice recognition technology? <laughs> no, they don't do Scottish accents. <laughs> Eleven. Could you please repeat that? <laughs> Eleven. 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 Could you please repeat that? Eleven. <laughs> Whose idea was this? That about sums it up, right? This is, uh, this is the experience that a lot of people have with speech recognition today. But I would tell you, my thinking about this has changed in the past 12 months. I'm pretty sure that your thinking is also going to change over the next year or two. And it's going to change for a couple of very clear reasons. Uh, the first reason is that we are going to live in this world where we are surrounded by computing devices of all shapes and sizes. These devices will be in our home, they'll be in our office, they'll be in our car, we will we may be wearing them, they'll certainly be in our pocket, and we will come to expect that we can quickly get information that we need from these devices. Most of these devices won't have keyboards. What that means is that the only way we can have rich interaction, the only way that we can um, get access to information quickly is through national inputs like voice, touch, and gesture. Uh, the other reason that, uh, that you're going to thinking is going to change on this is because after, at long last, the technology is finally going to work great. Uh, and what we've seen in, uh, in this space in the past 18 months is some of the commercial speech recognition technologies have seen a dramatic 30% improvement in their accuracy just in the past 18 months. And to put that into perspective, that's a bigger gain in performance than we've seen in the past uh, 10 years combined. So that's, uh, so that's pretty good news. Um, and so what this means is that you're going to start to see this technology start to appear everywhere. Uh, uh, and the reason that it's going to appear everywhere <laughs> is because um, the technology is going to start to take advantage of what we call this virtuous cycle of AI. So, so what does that mean? So AI systems in general are powered by data. And the more data that you have, the better these systems perform. But the big catch-22 of most uh, AI systems is that if they're not useful, then people are not going to use them. And if people aren't using them, you don't have enough data to make the system better. And since the system's not good, people don't use it. That's the catch-22. Well, the good news is that for speech recognition, uh, for the first time, there's significant numbers of people using this so that this virtuous cycle of AI can start kicking into high gear. Just to give you some numbers, um, uh, within the past, well, so within the past six months, for some models of smartphones, one out of every three searches that's being done is being done with voice. 
This is the first time this has happened. So that's, that's a big deal for AI scientists that are trying to make this technology better. And so what this means is that users are using the technology, which means they're generating more data, which can be used to improve the performance of the underlying algorithms, which opens up whole new areas of applicability to this technology, which means even more users will use it, and this virtuous cycle starts to take off. And that's exactly what's uh, started to happen in the past 6 to 12 months in speech recognition. And so what's going to happen over the next few years is you're going to start to see these intelligent voice interfaces appear in a lot of places where you've never seen them before. So they're going to be inside many of the apps that you use every day. They're going to be on many of the websites that you go to. They're certainly going to be on all these devices. You'll be able to go into your workplace and there's many of the applications or maybe there'll be an intelligent commerce room that'll be able to listen to certain things that you say. Um, and this is great. As this change happens, it's going to transform numerous multi-billion dollar industries from mobile applications and mobile devices uh, to these uh, new generation of connected home or smart TV applications. Uh, it'll be in the enterprise and a lot of the applications that businesses uh, rely on every day. It'll be in your car, it'll be in this new generation of wearable devices. Um, and it will change the way that you interact with your devices and it's going to change the way that developers have to build applications for these devices. And that poses a, today a really big challenge for developers. The developers that want to take advantage of this in their technology platforms have to do a lot of very hard things nowadays. Some of the things that, these, that you need to solve if you're going to build this technology into your applications are you have to write this low-level audio processing code across all the platforms that you want to support, all the devices you want to support. No small task. Uh, you have to implement sophisticated natural language processing algorithms to be able to understand questions that users are asking. In many cases, you have to build your own custom knowledge graph that can potentially contain millions of searchable concepts or entities. Uh, this powers the intelligence of these systems. And then you also have to implement some advanced machine learning algorithms. This allows the system to pick exactly the right answer to whatever questions that users ask. So this today represents one of the hardest long-standing AI problems that exists. And if you wanted to build this, you probably need an army of PhDs, which means that right now, uh, the only companies that can do this are a very small number of, um, of large technology companies. For everyone else, it's beyond reach. But there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And the light is the way that developers are building applications are changing. Increasingly, we're relying more and more on these cloud-based services and developer APIs to be able to plug sophisticated technology into our application without, without having to do a lot of heavy lifting. And in this case of uh, building voice-powered intelligence, a couple of products have come on the market just in the past six months that promise to do that. Uh, one of the uh, products is one that our company launched uh, three months ago. It's a developer platform called the MyMeld API. And this makes it possible for uh, developers and even non-developers to build, to incorporate this voice-driven intelligence into their applications without having to write a lot of low-level code. Uh, the way this works is our developers go to our website, developer.expectlabs.com, they sign up for a developer account, and then they generally need to do three things to plug this voice function out into their application. The first thing that they do is they will point us to their collection of content, which is either a database or a website. We have technology that will automatically crawl through that content and turn it into a knowledge representation or a knowledge graph that's used to power the intelligence behind the platform. And that can all happen without writing, writing a single line of code. The second thing our customers want to do is they generally want to have a, a voice front end so that when developers go to their application, they can start talking, the microphone starts listening, analyzing in real time, processing what they're saying. We make that as easy as dropping in a line of code for most of the major platforms. And then once that's in place, they use our service to answer questions that users ask, or, uh, or provide proactive suggestions based on things that users said. And in many, many cases, many applications, this literally can happen in a matter of minutes, greatly simplifying this task of building voice-powered intelligence into your applications. Um, so this product has been around for uh, three months now. There's already hundreds of companies that are building some really cool applications on this technology. And you're going to start to see these applications come to market over the next six months, year, two years. And that's very exciting to um, us and the people in this field. But um, what's even more exciting is what could be possible five years, 10 years, 15 years from now. In fact, there's a lot of AI researchers that think that we are 
now on this path of creating this universal intelligence system that can answer questions uh, about just about any, anything, right? And this, um, this field was, was given a big kickstart three years ago when IBM created their Watson supercomputer. It was really good at answering Jeopardy questions, surprisingly good at answering Jeopardy questions. And then from this point, a lot of AI research started to connect the dots and say, if we can just build out expertise in these systems for more and more content domains, maybe it might be possible to create this intelligent system that could answer just about any question that we could throw at it. So IBM's system was built on this uh, data set that contained well, roughly around 100 million unique concepts or entities. Um, and since then, big companies like Apple and Google have been investing in the space. And the intelligent systems that they currently have are built on these data sets that uh, capture about close to a billion concepts, certainly in the high hundreds of millions. And then, so I raised this question, how big do these knowledge sets have to be before we actually have this intelligent system that understands just about everything? And the answer is it's not infinite. There are a finite number of concepts uh, in human language and human knowledge. In fact, uh, most researchers agree that once you start getting up into the hundreds of billions of unique concepts, you actually start to capture most of the important knowledge uh, that exists. And so, that is a very clear path, but we also have a very long way to go. And in my opinion, this represents what I think is the, the new grand challenge for AI. It's sort of our industry's version of the Human Genome Project. And uh, as many folks that think it's very possible that the industry could get together and have focused work, uh, to start going down this path, that potentially in a decade or less, we might actually have one of these intelligent assistants that can answer a surprisingly large range of questions. So whether it's the, uh, the Star Trek computer or this uh, Jarvis assistant from the Iron Man movies, uh, it is certainly possible within a decade that these technologies that currently only live in science fiction may actually be products that we can use on a daily basis. And I think um, that's very exciting. Uh, and I want to leave you with that thought. So thank you very much for your attention. back for a round table at the end, but I just want to ask one question now. So, anticipatory computing sounds extremely cool, but um, machines that captured everything we said and analyzed it raises obvious privacy concerns. Where would the data be stored? How would you protect against its abuse? Or how would you allow it to be appropriately used? Yeah, so there's, I think every time, with this, these technologies and just about all the technology we're talking about today, there are big privacy concerns. And I think um, our company's policy, and I think the policy that we have to insist on for the companies, is that they put that data in the control of the users and are transparent about how it's used. And I think as long as we uh, enforce those standards, um, then it's possible we can leverage the benefits of this technology without having to be misused. Do you believe that ordinary users understand the use cases about how their information is used so they can make intelligent decisions about data use? Uh, I think it's uh, something that's generational. I think, uh, I think the younger generation that's lived their life online has this implicit understanding of, uh, of what data is actually in circulation and what isn't. But, I, but regardless, I think it's the onus is on the companies that are doing this to educate the users, make that information available. Tim, I'll be back in a second. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Tim.